Hi everyone, I'm Les. And I'm Ashley. And you're listening to Anthropotamus, where we explore some of your favorite anthropology topics. Hey everyone, welcome back to our latest episode of Anthropotamus. Today we will be reviewing The World Without Us by Alan Wiseman. Les, what did you think about this book? What are your first thoughts when you think about this book? Oh, my first impression is uh, doom and gloom. <laughs> like, honestly, um, when you when you read a lot of, um, you know, anthropological work, you get very used to thinking of humans in a certain light. And when you read a lot of ecological work, you certainly think of us in a different light. And the, the, uh, the combination of the two in this one book was... Well, let's put it this way. It was staggering. <laughs> it, it made me think twice. So, okay. So I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I couldn't finish the book. Um, not because it's a bad book. I'm just a very impatient person. And it's very, very descriptive writing. And I know people who love descriptive writing and like the, this huge picture drawn out for them. But I'm the type of person that just wants a person other person to get to the point so um for me I just felt like the book could have been shorter but definitely even though I didn't finish it it still definitely had an impact I think I think I was reading the book and just two days before I had put like ant bait out to kill all these ants in my bathroom and then I'm reading this book and I'm like oh my god I'm such a horrible person I just killed this whole colony of ants just because I want to live in suburbia (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I've been questioning a lot of things since I started the book. and I mean, when I initially started it, I, I got a little ways into it, and then it was just so... There were so many things that I do in my personal life that negatively impact our environment. That I, it, it, The information is valuable. It serves a good point, but it is very sharp. It's a little bit of a wake up call. I think we recognize that. I mean, growing up in the '90s, there was always this, like these commercials about recycling, and uh, you know, your elementary school teacher talking about how important recycling is, but they, you know, now no one ever puts in your face how impactful we really are to the environment. And it was a little bit of a slap to the face about, wow, we are really wasteful people, and we should be ashamed of ourselves. Yeah, I mean. You know, there are a lot of reasons to be a little more eco-conscious and a lot of ways to do it. But just, you know, the this, the amount of things that you are told can help but are only, you know, really just you know, appeasements like biodegradable plastic and other things like that. It's, it, it's uh, not really that helpful. It, yeah, it's not. It's, it's not really that helpful. And the only way to like make a meaningful impact is to simply stop existing according to this book (laughs) um interesting enough so there's there's you know that chapter about uh microplastic particles in the beach and how it's mixed in the sand and all that research on it i actually just spoke with somebody in class yesterday who's actually studying microplastic particles or however you would say that in snow and i was like well i never even thought about plastic being in snow that's you know, no one, um, it's just not something you think about, you know, you know, we're being so wasteful and use so much plastic that now we have plastic in our snow. That's incredible. Yeah, that's, uh, it's kind of terrible. Just a little terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talk about a holly jolly Christmas. Huh? <laughs> uh, we need to stop with those plastic Christmas trees. Uh Christmas ornaments, Christmas trees, Christmas bows. Plastic, everything. Everything's plastic. Something I was thinking about, too, the other day, there's like, you know, where I live, I live in an area, it's new development. There's still some open, you know, open lots where they haven't built homes yet. And I see this hair, you know, running across Walgreens. And I'm thinking, oh, this poor little bunny, we've taken its land and some bulldozers probably killed its little babies. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) But now after reading this book, that's what I think about when I see, like, little animals. Uh, That reminds me. um, I was... This book kept reminding me of this as I was reading it. And I was... uh, 
I, I don't know. It was there was a I don't know if it was a prompt or a movie trailer or a description, something I read or, or heard. It talked about what would happen if all animals suddenly decided to fight back against humans for everything. And I'm like, well, absolutely nothing because, you know, we're we're basically death machines. It's just like you look at all of the all of the land that we have taken and even in that there was a chapter that discussed um the uh the extinction of the mammoths and the northern migration of uh, homo sapiens and how none of the megafauna up in that northern region had evolved alongside humans and so none of them had evolved instincts to uh, defend themselves against somebody something so small and innocuous looking as a, as a human and um i believe it was the clovis tribe that was uh, or the clovis peoples that were moving up north that way and just completely wiping out species after species of megafauna which were massive and for those of us who or for those of you who don't know what megafauna are um, that's just a very large animal think elephants or rhinoceros uh, things like that um i don't i mean i'm sure he, this is something i didn't necessarily agree with him on this book is yes i'm sure humans coming in did have an impact on population size of megafauna but i mean really did humans have the ability to call cause these megafauna to go extinct with their you know arrows and axe laddles or at laddles um so i i really feel like that it's really more probably multiple factors that contributed to the uh their extinction and i felt like the author really was just focusing on human humans hunting them just to prove a point of how destructive we can be i agree with you but i also think that the correlation is too strong to ignore uh, there, there's definitely a major link between humans uh, entering the area and the mass diet. Obviously, there was a change in um, climate as well, because it was um, during an ice age that had been starting to warm, and uh, there, I mean, there were there were definitely a lot more factors than just people. But I, you know, I, I don't think that we should underestimate the uh, the impact of uh, large scale hunting and the ingenuity that we uh as as humans use to feed our large groups right i mean i think that's part of the reason makes it so so destructive is our innovation to survive mm -hmm. um, our technology well it's the same as any other animal if uh if you i mean even looking at um like beavers or uh river otters things like that you have change in the habitat right they they chew down trees or even elephants right you're you're knocking down entire forest right and um you you do that they do that to survive right just like we do things to survive and unfortunately there are consequences right and that those consequences come in the uh the shape well, many shapes, you know, there's the plastics, there's the extinction events and all of these other things. Something else in the book I thought was very interesting was he discusses, I can't remember where this was at. It was in the Mediterranean somewhere, but people are buying, basically cheap homes are being built, cheap beachfront homes are being built and being sold for very low prices so you have these people moving in and buying up these homes but these homes own really they're built so badly they only last for like 10 years and i'm thinking like why would you want to bother buying a house that's only going to last you like 10 years i mean location 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 right, right? yeah and i'm thinking well <laughs> if, i mean i guess in a way it makes sense if you're retired you're going to die soon anyways, and you can do whatever you want with your money. Might as well go buy a cheap beachfront house. But if you're living more than 10 years, then you're going to have to start putting money into to remodeling the home eventually. But then I guess 
buying a cheap house and remodeling it might still be cheaper than, you know, buying a house off the coast of, you know, Monterey. So I don't know. Yeah. I thought that was I thought that was weird. Like, why would you waste your money on a house that's gonna fall apart on you? I mean if I had a, a section of land along the beachfront, even if the house that was on it wasn't, you know, immaculate or fantastic and overly built, I think that I would still, uh, I would still be happy there, and even use the time to reinforce and upgrade, you know, the home that I had. You can do a lot of stuff in ten years. That's true. I mean, I guess you could slowly remodel it, but then I'm thinking. I mean, the reason you buy a new house is so that you don't have to do that yourself. Yeah, but like you said, buying a beach house in Monterey versus a beach house out there is a big difference in price. Most people now probably wouldn't be able to live comfortably uh, outside of one of these, you know, overpriced, overheated, uh, you know, concrete jungles, as, uh, as people would say. I don't know. I think we're very adaptive. I think if something happened and we had to, we would, you know, we would adapt and adjust, but we don't want to. <laughs> I mean, I like to be optimistic. I think that a significant portion of um, of the human race or the human species would be just fine. I would just like to say that most people who know me know that I do not like nature, but... Contrary to what they would believe about me, I would be able to survive. <laughs> oh, I believe that about you, even though I know you don't like me. <laughs> I would, I would survive. I'm just saying, I would, yeah. I would, I don't like being around dirt. But <laughs> <laughs> see, I don't mind getting dirty. I, I'm a digger. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind digging. Let's put it that way. I, I know a little bit about how to grow my own food. I know plenty about how to catch my own food. So I think I would be okay, but as far as constructing, you know, houses or anything like that, I think I might be a little bit out of my depth. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able to build a house. I... No, actually, I might be able to get a rig something. I mean, I could, um... I could build a lean-to, I could build a lean-to, <laughs> but uh, I doubt that my own wife would, would uh, enjoy that very much. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? I don't, I mean... For those of us who are old oh enough to have grown uh, up watching Saved by the Bell, there's an episode where the girls and the guys are competing against each other, and they're like, Lisa, we thought you couldn't cook. And she's like, I never said I couldn't cook. I just said I wouldn't cook. And I'm just like, that's me. I don't like nature, but that doesn't mean I can't oh, yeah. Yeah. Preference, survive right? out We in have nature. that luxury. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, so even though, I mean, I mean, really, I think the only issue I really had with the book was I'm, I'm just an impatient reader and I don't really like when it's just too descriptive, but I know people who do really love the imagery. Um, so maybe if you're a really impatient person like I am, it's maybe not the book for you, but if you really like a story being told, um, and want to feel horrible for being a wasteful human being it's definitely got that that flavor um if you if you like feeling bad about uh <laughs> about being a human then read this book um <laughs> it's i mean i mean i mean i didn't even finish it and i still felt it was very impactful so I think I think that says a lot the fact that I didn't even finish the book but it still had an impact on me. Well, you see my my biggest problem was the t the style of narration that that uh the uh the author used switching between, you know, personal accounts of people and the what if scenarios was kind of jarring for me. It was if you think of it from the image that he paints, it was it was cool. It was interesting. And I, I will say this: I have always had a fascination with like abandoned cities. Um, coming across coming across, you know, photos and other things of uh, of ruins has just sparked my imagination on many different occasions. So the the scenarios were very interesting to me. 
but the way he went about conveying that information was stifling. I almost... Um, I was going to say, I almost feel like our, our one complaint about the book is very similar. It's just the the writing style. Yeah, I mean, I liked the information, and I do sometimes enjoy feeling bad about being a human, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I, I could not get into the writing style. And I'm, I'm somebody, I'm an avid reader. But maybe that's, I mean... I think part of that is he was targeting a different audience. Like we're we're anthropologists. Oh, I, one day I'll be an anthropologist, right? That's what that's what we're studying. And I think we're used to approaching the su- these subjects in a different way. Whereas he was trying to create this very descriptive like world for people who typically don't study this and you know want to grab these the attention of people who are outside of you know the the academic world you see i get that but i think he went the wrong way about it he it the, the way he went about it felt very much the same as um well dystopia writers and don't get me wrong i'd like a good dystopia story but um it felt overly moralistic for me um mm. You yeah. shouldn't do this, shaking your finger at the audience. What are you doing, you bad humans? You know, <laughs> it was uh, it was too much. It was too much. Uh, he could have dialed that tone back a lot and still gone into a very interesting, very good story. Um, if that's the way he was trying to write it, as it is, I feel like it's gonna it's the the style and the the tone that he uses is gonna kick out all but the most right. Um, very specific targets. Very specific targets. People who are already interested. I don't think that it's going to be very... Um, it's gonna. I don't think it's going to capture the people, like, the populace as a whole is the problem. Right. Not saying anything wrong about the, uh, the information. It, it's good information and it's an interesting book. But I feel like most people who read it are just going to think, oh... So what you're saying is my lifestyle is wrong. Which we've already been told that, you know, since, you know, recycling lessons in first grade. Yeah. And I mean, you know, how well, how well did that work? You know, um, you still, I mean, we, we have a lot of recycling going on. We still have people who throw, you know, bags of, of garbage out the window on the highway. I saw that happen just the other day. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie. I half the time don't recycle my bottles and I waste a lot of paper towels. I probably killed a lot of trees. Yeah, I mean, it's uh it's people only do it when it's convenient to be honest. Like if you mm-hmm. if if you have to go If you don't make it convenient, people aren't going to do it. If you have to go out of your way to recycle, then it's just not going to be recycled. Yeah, that's true. Which is part of the reason why I don't recycle my bottles and stuff, because I'm like, I'm not setting these aside and walking them outside, because uh-huh. that's how lazy I am. Up until recently, I, I lived in a, an apartment complex that didn't have a recycle can um, next to my building. I, I They had one for the entire set of complex, but it was a, it was a really long walk. So it it was just like I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> it's it too far. Like it would have taken me five I... minutes to walk out there, but uh, it was just too far. It's like you know what? The only time I ever take this out is when I'm going on, you know, uh, going to work, or if I if I'm heading out towards the um, you know wherever I'm going. As I'm heading the right direction, I'll drop it off on the way. But I'm not. I'm never over there, so I'm just not gonna walk over to that can. There's one right outside my door. <laughs> Like that's the two seconds. We only re- we only recycle boxes, and that's because it would overflow fill the up trash our trash can. can. Yep. <laughs> yeah, right now we're in so, a new place. It's it, you know we have a recycle can, but the recycle can doesn't have a specific area because there's too much trash being thrown out. So they have they have two trash cans in the gate fence. The recycle can is on the outside, on the opposite side. So it's really even tough for me to bring myself to walk around out there and toss it you know actually after reading this book i was like i really should recycle my stuff instead of just (laughs) throw it away and i 
And I get on, you know, Amazon because mm-hmm. I have my Prime. And I was like, maybe I'll just buy one of those recycling cans where one side's recycling, one side's trash, and then make it more convenient. And I'm looking online, and this trash can is like $200. And I'm like, nope, we're That's not going to start recycling would today. That? Why would I spend $200 on a recycling can or a freaking trash slash recycling can? You know can? what we really need uh, is that, uh, that one, like, re- that one recycling can from Sims that just converts it directly into electrical energy, right? It doesn't really exist, but it should, <laughs> right? And I think we need to get scientists working on that. Just you know, maybe there is. Yeah, you know, maybe there is. And if that's the case, that needs to be a public works project that will, I mean, honestly improve the entire world. Just saying. All public trash <sighs> All cans right. should just recycle things in directly into energy. I am not a scientist, so I would not even know how to begin with hey, that. Hey, anthropology is science. That's, yeah, but not that kind of science. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to begin with that. Um, so, yeah, there you have it. Uh, the world without us and how we now feel like lazy, horrible, shameful human beings. I mean, the world would definitely look better without us. Um, I, I, I will true. say that as, you know as a human and as an anthropologist, I think that, you know, the human mind is one of the most valuable things to come out of um, the, the world in general. Like we, you know, there's, there's nothing quite like the human mind. And, you know, when you look at all of the ideas that people have written down, whether it's, um, you know, architecture or engineering work or, you know, fiction, like novel writing, all of that. It's, it's fantastic. And I think the universe in general would be poorer for our loss. Yeah. Well, definitely, uh, definitely impactful book. And I, I would say, I mean, if you really want to get a new perspective on how we impact, impact the earth, then you, don't mind feeling bad about it uh, i would recommend the book you will feel but bad it definitely about it. you will yeah you're gonna feel bad about it but um i mean you're gonna feel bad but it the book will uh, definitely impact you and start making you um you know have a little bit of a different perspective on you know your own behavior and do you have anything else for us last no no, I think that's about all I had. Like, I could go on and on about the subject. Um, I did enjoy the book. Thank you all for listening. Distribution of Anthropotamus is in collaboration with the American Anthropological Association. Please continue to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Anthropotamus for our latest episodes, show notes, and book discussion schedule.